Let us pray. Lord of prophetic utterance, speak through your servant today to all those who would listen and receive this preached word. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever heard of a television series called Green Acres? A New York City attorney decides to leave his high-powered, high-stress job and move his wife and himself to a rural farming community called Hooterville, where a whole cast of characters live. Among them is a family called the Zipples, Fred, Doris, and Arnold who just happens to be a pig. Arnold was no ordinary pig who ate from a trough and lived in a pen. Arnold was a member of the Ziffel family who lived in the home, ate at the table, wore clothes, went to school, and slept in a bed. For all intents and purposes, Arnold Ziffel was the equivalent to Fred and Doris's son one happy Hooterville family. Those who are familiar with the series know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've never seen the show before, you can likely access episodes on Hulu, Netflix, and MeTV. In our last episode of Second Samuel's story of King David, David impregnates Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and arranges for Uriah to be killed. In 2 Samuel 12, the saga continues as David brings Bathsheba into his household to make her one of his wives. On the surface, the general public would think David has done a noble deed by taking in the newly widowed wife of his former bodyguard. But God reveals to Nathan, the prophet, what is really happening. A prophet is someone who hears from God or has visions from God, and the prophet speaks truthfully of what he or she hears or sees, and God has shown the prophet Nathan the truth about King David. The king and the prophet have a close relationship, and some have even preached that one of David's brothers whose name is Nathaniel, is also said to be the same person as Nathan. Whether these two are one and the same is questionable, but what is certain is that David fully received what the prophet had to say to him. Nathan goes to David with a message that is in the form of a problem or a parable. There were two men said Nathan, one rich and one poor. The rich man had very many sheep and cattle, and the poor man had nothing but one small sheep, which he had bought. He cared for it, and it grew up under his hair along with his children. It ate from his bread, drank from his cup, and slept in his bosom. It was a daughter to him. Sounds a little bit like Arnold. Of course, we already know that the rich man is David as Nathan continues the story. Then a guest came to the rich man. The wealthy host was too miserly to take any of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But instead, he took the poor man's sheep and prepared it for the guests who had come to him. Now imagine that. The rich lawyer had visitors from New York City, and instead of securing the guest's meal from his vast resources, he decides to slaughter Arnold Ziffel and serve him at a backyard barbecue. Like Arnold the pig, the little sheep which was prepared was more than a head of livestock, but a beloved member of the family. 
we too would react with abject outrage by what this rich man has done. And we understand why King David declares, as God lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He shall pay fourfold for the sheep since he did this and had no pity. As David is passing judgment on the rich man, David is also unknowingly dictating the terms of his own prosecution and conviction. Once David renders his judgment on this unidentified wrongdoer, Nathan immediately declares, you are the man. And with this revelation, the voice of God begins to speak. Why have you treated God's word with contempt, doing evil in my sight? You cut down Uriah with a sword and took his wife as your wife. I will raise evil against you from your own house. I will do this in the sight of Israel in the open. Because David has done all his dirty dealings covertly from his initial plot to the very last plot. Even though David did not have the physical weapon in his hand that ended Uriah's life, David developed the plot and his orders were followed. His will was executed by the blind obedience of others acting on his behalf. Therefore, in the eyes of God, David is guilty. Moreover, God is letting David know his sin has been fully exposed, although David thought it was well hidden. While we as humans can commit sin, both knowingly and unknowingly, David commits deliberate sin and tries to conceal it. While all sin is displeasing to God, there are different aspects in which we commit sin. For instance, transgression is committing a sin knowingly. When we go beyond a clear boundary, God does not want us to cross, that is called trespass. When we premeditatedly plot and scheme to execute sin, that is called iniquity. Whether we term it transgression, trespass, iniquity, or plain old-fashioned sin, all sin constitutes humans being in a spiritual condition which separates us from God. And God does not want us to remain in that condition. When David finally recognizes the depth and breadth of his sin, admits his personal guilt and confesses, then finally repents from his willful actions and seeks forgiveness, the prophet Nathan in turn speaks God's message that God had accepted David's atonement. Therefore, Nathan serves as a catalyst by which God is able to bring David to a point of repentance such that the glory of God's anointing is able to shine and David's dignity is restored, thereby allowing David to raise his head from the shame of his sin, wherein Nathan prophetically proclaims God's forgiveness. And David responds, instead of my beheading, you have raised my head. David like Taylor Swift and Dolly Parton, memorialized many events in his life by writing songs. When he wrote Psalm 51, he is acknowledging and confessing to God the wrong that he has done, repenting and seeking forgiveness by asking God to create in him a clean heart. To be clear, God hates sin because sin separates us from a relationship with God. When we commit sin, we are offending God and hurting one another. However, God stands ready to forgive 
all those who would repent of their sin, which is why God gave God's only begotten son to be a sacrifice for us, a sacrifice greater than a beloved sheep, a sacrifice greater than a pet lamb. The lamb of God, who is Jesus Christ, has given himself to be the sacrifice for all those who would receive him. Let us pray. And repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. I confess my sins to you. And ask your divine forgiveness. As I repent of my sin. Come into my heart. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for saving me. Amen.